Thank you, Jakub. As Jakub mentioned, I'm a user experience practitioner, and I'm an entrepreneur in the nonprofit civic technology world, so I guess that makes me a technologist, but I really feel I'm a humanist first because the problems that we're trying to solve are problems related to human beings. They're not about technology. How many of you have ever witnessed a lot of work go into a project and have it launch and then not get much usage? Yeah. If you work in the field of international development or civic technology, you know this happens all the time. Let me share with you some projects that didn't get much usage. Is anyone familiar with what this is? Yeah? Do you want to say what it is? Yeah. It's the play pump water system that was intended to use the energy of children while they were playing to operate a water pump that could be used to supply rural communities in Africa with clean drinking water. It won the World Bank Marketplace Award in 2000. It raised millions of dollars in international donor funds. But a few years later, negative reports about it started to surface, which led to the loss of a lot of their international funding. Do you know why it failed? It failed because, in reality, it was adults who were frequent users of the system because children's play couldn't produce enough water to meet the needs of the entire community. In fact, sometimes adults and children were in competition for the play pump because one wanted to play, the other needed to fetch water for the community. Another problem was that the roundabout was not designed for adults to use, so it was painful and undignified for adults to, to use. It's too low in height for them. They don't want to sit on it like children, so they have to lean over to use it, and it gives them a sore back. And elderly people can't use it. Children also complain because it's actually pretty hard to turn the roundabout because there's a lot of resistance as the pump is lifted. In many places, play pumps replaced good, working, easy-to-use hand pumps, and they cost four times as much as the hand pumps that they replaced. In many places, food growing had to stop when the play pumps replaced the hand pumps because it took much longer to collect water. Why do projects fail in practice? Projects fail when we build without understanding the full context of needs and usage. When we design solutions without input from the final stakeholders, whose ownership and engagement is critical to the long-term success of the project, and when we build without first testing and getting feedback. The problem here was lack of understanding the context of use. In the case of the play pump, the communities hadn't been consulted at all, and they had no say in what kind of pump they wanted. The first time the residents found out about it was when the play pump was installed and the community leader told them that this is where you now need to go to get your water from. So this, of course, enhanced their feeling of disempowerment and their dissatisfaction with the system. This was a very big price to pay. Doing some research in the field with the end users would have brought to light many of these social and practical concerns. I'll show you another example of a project that failed. The city of Boston's transportation department in the United States installed two public parklets in two different neighborhoods. These are small public areas where locals can hang out and sit and chat and read. They cost somewhere between $15,000 and $25,000 each, and no one ever sits there. Can you guess why they failed? There's a mic, actually, if somebody wants to raise their hand. Okay, sure. Yes, that's one reason, absolutely. It turns out that people were... Sorry? Right, exactly. Those are the two reasons. It turns out that people were deterred by the shape of the bench. It's curved in shape, uh, and also by there being right adjacent to street traffic. You can't really sit on that and have a conversation with anyone. They look more like art installations than inviting benches. Here, they had to do even less work to test it out beforehand. Just put up some sturdy cardboard or plastic prototypes in the actual space and ask people to sit there. But it seems that the desire to provide an innovative curved design trumped the basic human need for comfortable seating. It seemed more like they were following a trend rather than looking at a real need. When public space projects aren't successful, they're quickly maligned by the public, and it makes city agencies wary of experimenting with new ideas in the future. But experimenting with new ideas is not a bad thing. It's how you go about it that matters. The important thing is that you actively involve intended users and learn from them, which they are now doing in Boston. Here's a small example from my own organization. 
I founded and run Code for Pakistan, and one of the things we do is we run a fellowship program in partnership with the World Bank and a provincial government in Pakistan. The first year, one of the fellowship teams launched a mobile application where people could take photos and report electricity theft in their neighborhood, because people can steal electricity by just placing a wire on an electrical line. But like most citizen reporting applications, unless the government is actively paying attention and responding to these reports and following up with progress, the citizen reports just sit there and eventually citizens stop reporting because there's no action being taken. The team had thought that when the reports would start coming in, the government would take notice, and uh, what they didn't learn until much later was that the city agency that was in charge of responding to these reports didn't actually have the capacity or desire to respond to citizen reports. In this case, the team needed to look at the entire system. There are multiple users of the system, not just the citizens who are reporting, and they needed to understand all of them before deciding to build this application. So if you like to think in terms of equations, good intentions with the wrong mindset leads to bad design. Or to put it in a more positive light, you need to engage the actual users to understand their needs instead of first inventing a solution in a vacuum. This is why innovation units in the social impact space have started to emphasize that the very first principle of technology innovation is to design with the user. This first image on the left is from the Principles for, International, for, for Digital Development, where a number of international aid agencies came together and they decided to come up with a list of principles for how to go about doing technology for good. And the principles start with principle number one, design with the user. Even the international aid agencies get this now when they come together. The UK government digital service lists their principle number one, start with needs, and if you can read the second line, it says the user's needs, not the government's or the project manager's needs. Code for America, same thing, start with people's needs. This is the first principle of innovation. You have to lead with people, not with the problems. So how do you do that? You follow user-centered design. What is user-centered design? It's more of a mindset and an approach than anything else. It's the process of designing a solution according to a philosophy where the end user's needs and limitations are a focus at all stages. The goal is basically that rather than requiring users to adapt their behaviors and beliefs in order to learn your system, that you design the product in a way where it supports the intended user's existing beliefs and behaviors and attitudes. Or to put it bluntly, don't waste time and money making a product that no one wants. The result of employing user-centered design is that it has so much insight built into the product that it offers a more satisfying, efficient, and user-friendly experience for the customer, which is more likely to lead to user adoption, increased sales, and customer loyalty. So earlier I showed you examples of failed projects. What do successful projects look like? Let me walk you through a couple of examples of successful projects. The first project I'll show you is a sanitation project in Ghana that was done by IDEO. How many of you have heard of IDEO? IDEO is an innovation and design consulting firm that has been doing incredible work for 25 years. They used user-centered design to create an in-home toilet for the urban poor in a place where they only had public toilets. But what's important, though, is that they didn't go in with the mindset of creating an in-home toilet. They didn't go in with the solution. In the first phase, they focused on uncovering new opportunities for providing in-home sanitation. They conducted interviews, they used research tools like inspiration cards, which you can see in this picture, and lots of observations and shadowing people to gain a deeper understanding of people's daily lives and their sanitation needs and preferences. If you look at the diagram at the bottom, this is the first step in the user-centered design process. It's about building empathy. Empathy is not just sympathy for someone else's situation. It's a deep intuition for how to live their lives and to under, really a deep understanding of their needs and problems. You have to immerse yourself in the problem from the user's perspective so that you're not relying on your own preconceptions or domain expertise, but you're really learning and understanding the needs of the people that you want to help. After the first phase, they took all their learnings and they then defined the problem based on the insights that they had acquired. This specific user needs to do X because of this surprising insight. They went back to the United States, they brainstormed solutions, and they focused on figuring out a design direction. 
And then they spent the next few weeks building and refining prototypes of their early ideas. Then they went back to Ghana with four toilet prototypes, each one designed to test a different functional approach. They left each toilet with a family for several days, and then they returned afterwards to collect their feedback, gather the toilets, and repeat the test with another family. And they went in openly and honestly, and this is the kind of extremely useful feedback they obtained as a result. This is a quote from one of the people who tested the prototype. This would be great for my elderly mother, but it's too complicated. It should be so simple that nobody can mess it up. That's really useful to know up front that it's too complicated. It's good, but it's too small. We'd need at least two for our family. Size matters. They learned all these things, that the water flush was confusing, what the favorite branding was, what kind of pricing and payment model would work. For instance, one of the things they learned is that people were used to paying very small amounts at the public toilet. So they realized that the service needed to accommodate frequent small payments. This is a sort of detail that they wouldn't have known if they hadn't gone in and tested with the users and spent time with them. So based on the feedback and testing that they did in Ghana, they went back and created a urine-diverting toilet with a biodigester and a removable sealed waste tank. And they created a product that had been tested through the entire end-to-end -end life cycle with all the different types of users, including how the tanks could easily be stacked for transportation by the service people who needed to take it for cleaning. The outcome was very profound and successful in achieving their goal. So let me show you a different example from a city government in contrast with the Boston example I showed earlier. In San Francisco, where I live, the city has put up public parklets all over with huge success. There are at least 47 public parklets in San Francisco and many more in progress. And they're very, very popular. So what's the difference between San Francisco's parklets and Boston's? In San Francisco, they've been involving the neighbors and the local businesses as participants in the process. And they're prototyping using a temporary kit of parts to create a solution that's low cost and can be easily adapted based on feedback. Another benefit of involving locals in the design process is that it's a natural generator of excitement and buy-in. It really doesn't take much in terms of time or resources to test a basic prototype. You put a few chairs, make it look inviting, and you test your design rather than build the whole thing and then learn that nobody wants to use it. <clears throat> there is, in fact, an annual parking day event that is now global, where people test parklet design and location. This picture is from the very first parking day event that was held in San Francisco in 2005 by an organization called Rebar. They literally just put in coins in the meter to take over a two-hour metered parking spot, and in two hours, they learned a lot. I bet that in Boston, if the parklet locations had been determined during a parking day event, where the locals organized into teams, and they chose their locations and gathered materials to create the type of design they wanted, they would have created successful parklet prototypes for a fraction of the cost and time. Here's the important thing. Two hours is enough to get useful information. People often worry about how much overhead prototyping and testing will add, given that projects are almost always short on time. When I teach my user experience class, I always get asked, how many people do you need to test with? And I always show this graph by Jacob Nielsen. Take a look at this graph. What is it showing? Can anyone, would anyone like to raise their hand? No mathematicians? Yes, okay, there we go. Yeah, um, I'm a math student. Uh, so basically, it shows you the number of people um, who are needed to find the, the specific percentage of all possible problems, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And actually, that's a good answer. So I have a book to give away. So I'm also a teacher, and I like to ask questions, and sometimes I give away books. So you can get that after the talk. But the answer is, if you look at this graph, that you really only need to test with four or five users in order to get enough information to drive a next useful iteration of your prototype. That's it, four to five people. But the even more important thing on this graph is that if you take away one thing from this graph is that zero users give zero insights. So if you talk to zero users, you gain zero information. 
Let that sink in for a second. I mean, as soon as you collect information from a single user, your insights shoot up, and you've already learned about a third of everything that there is to know about the usability of your solution. The difference between zero and even a little bit of information is astounding. Prototyping and testing is a rapid iterative process. The picture at the bottom is actually a real early Nintendo prototype, and all they used was cardboard and paper and, uh, and pencil. That's the key difference between prototyping and piloting. In piloting, you spend energy creating your entire solution, and then you learn that it doesn't work, and you waste all that effort, and you have to redo it. With prototyping, you prototype only what you need. You create the smallest, most basic functionality of your solution that you need to test in order to get some information. You test your prototype early and often. Compared to piloting, prototyping saves on scale, duration, and materials, because you test with just four to five people who are your intended user type. Prototyping reduces misinterpretation. If a picture is worth 1,000 words, then a prototype is worth 10,000, because prototypes go beyond show and tell. They actually let you experience the design. They save you time, effort, money, and waste, and they reduce your risk of failure. Fear of failure is disconnecting us. Empathy, prototyping, and testing reduce that risk of failure. Ultimately, user-centered design is more a mindset than anything else. It's a different way of engaging challenges. It's a dogged focus on the user of the system. You don't need to make it process heavy. Design thinking is just a kind of disciplined openness, an openness with two aspects. First, you need to be receptive to understanding other people's needs and situations and perspectives. And second, we must be open to prototyping, trying new ideas, throwing them away, and learning from them, rather than getting hung up on first building a complete strategic plan. So it is possible to understand and connect, and there are tools to help us. User-centered design is fundamentally positive and forward-looking. So we end this session on hope and a very specific process and mindset of empathy that all of us can try to apply, no matter what the nature of our project is. Thank you.